Good morning. Love hearing the church sing about doctrinal truth. Amen. Our purpose for gathering is not about how we feel, but singing about the truth of God's Word and what He is to us. As we celebrate this week, He is our Savior, the one who bore our sin, and how can we but just say thanks? And I hope we do that this week. As Eric encouraged us, take some time to read Matthew 26 and read through that, that text with your family as a, as a devotional. Um, and do that. Well, we're in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8 this morning. Last week, we started our prophetic journal of Daniel. We're going to go through Daniel 7 through 12, but we were in Daniel 7 last week. And it's, again, Daniel seeing the future in prophecy. Well, I thought it'd be interesting just to start out our message since we're talking about dreams. I thought I'd share some dreams, not dreams that I've had, um, but dreams of other people, people that you don't even know, but just to kind of uh, lighten the mood a little bit this morning. So Alicia dreamt that she had a waffle head, and someone took a bite out of her head, and she died. And she woke up crying. Odd dream. Maybe she had waffles before she went to bed. Billy dreamt that a sloth was doing his nails, okay, and kept telling him how he should invest in the stock market. That's a bizarre dream. First, the guy having his nails done, but anyway, we won't go there. Again, you have to be an 80s kid to understand this one, but this one lady, uh, her name was Lucy, had a dream that she woke up to Bruce Springsteen in his Born in the USA get up, going through his, her sock drawer, taking all her socks. She did wake up that morning, checking her socks drawer to make sure all her socks were in her drawer. Boy, that one didn't fall. That one fell pretty, pretty bad, too. The first service, they didn't get any of these, but that's okay. So you guys aren't, do, you're, on, you're on the same, same path. Aaron, our last one. She dreamt that she was in the middle of the ocean with Pinocchio in a boat eating Fruit Loops. I guess if you're stuck in the middle of the ocean and you all, had to do, all you had to eat was Fruit Loops, that's a pretty good deal. If you're, if you're, if you're a teenager, my son's like, yes, Fruit Loops, yes. All right, so um, next time I talk about dreams, I'll have to come up with some other dreams. Or else you guys are asleep. All right, and hopefully you're not dreaming during our message this morning. Daniel 7, recap from last week. Well, Daniel had this dream of four beasts, if you remember. The, the lion with the wings represented the Babylonian kingdom, particularly represented Nebuchadnezzar. The bear represented the Medo-Persian empire. The four-headed leper with wings represented the Grecian empire. And of course, the beast that he could not describe, he was feared of, he was, he was very, very scared of this beast, was the Roman empire. Well, remember, in the middle of the dream, Daniel stopped. He said, okay, listen, I have some question here. I need a clarification on that other beast, that fourth unknown beast, who we believe in Revelation is the revised Roman empire. Well, Remember that little horn that was coming out with the eyes and the mouth? Who did that represent? Okay, you guys got to wake up this morning. All right, I, what I want you to do before we start, turn to the person behind you and say, good morning. All right, good. Okay, good. Are you guys awake now? You guys ready? Okay. All right, you guys good? Okay, so when I ask a question, you know, in return, for those who are watching Facebook, you don't get it. You're, you don't, you're not here. You don't get to be in on the joke here this morning. All right, so the little horn represents Antichrist. Very good. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate that. But see, we understood here at the end of this vision, we've seen God opening up his books with thousands of angels in front and in front, behind and in front of him, ready to execute judgment to the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the beast. And what we were encouraged last week is that Daniel seen a kingdom that the Son of Man, who is Jesus, setting up that will last forever and ever and ever and will not be destroyed and that's us and so that was the end of the vision that was in the first king of bel first year of belshazzar so now this morning let's go to daniel 8 you got your bibles out again my bible's all marked up from years of taking notes and i hope you can do the same because as we get done daniel in two weeks you'll another month a year three years down the road you'll open daniel someone will open the text and you'll be able to say oh i know what that means oh i know what this means because you're marking your bible up so i hope we come to learn but also you also want to come back to learn more about this great book 
So again, we see this text we are opening up in the third year of Belshazzar. We are going back in between Daniel 4 and 5. Daniel is still in the Babylonian kingdom with this dream. So as we did last week, we need to fast forward to verses 20 and 21. It gives a description of what these animals represent. We're going to be talking about a ram and a goat. Well, the angel tells Daniel what they mean. Just so you know, I'm not making this up. Let's go to verse 20 and 21. It says here, And for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these were, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between the eyes is the first king. Okay? So we understand the text tells us that the ram is Media Persia, and the goat is the Grecian Empire. All right. So we now understand what those two animals represent. So let's beginning, begin reading in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at first. And I saw in a vision, and then I saw, and I saw in Susa, the citadel, which was in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank on the, of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Just pause there a minute. So this ram has two horns. One is higher than the other. The higher, the, the, the higher horn, the longer horn, represents the Persian Empire, Media, Persia. Persia was the strong. It was the biggest kingdom. So just so you know what that horn represents and the differentiation of the horns. Verse 4. I saw the ram charging westward, northward, and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. So he's talking about the Medo-Persian Empire. He sees this ram representing that empire, and it can't be stopped. Okay, you got that picture in your mind? That's what he's seen in his dream. Look at verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, here comes this male goat. This male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. That's key there. Underline this. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceeding great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. So you have this great goat with the horn representing the, the, the Grecian Empire coming out of nowhere, destroying the ram, not touching the ground. And we understand who was the first king of the Grecian Empire, the first ruler? Alexander the Great. For Daniel, this is future. For us, Daniel 8 is history. Last week's dream, it was, all, it was future for Daniel. It was future for us. Now Daniel, he's seeing the future as the Grecian Empire right now. We can look back and say this had already happened. Alexander the Great was one of the greatest rulers of all time. He was young. And the idea that the goat did not touch the ground it gives the depiction that he took the road. The Greeks ruled the world with velocity, quickness, and no one could stop it. He was young. Actually, history tells us that his army only was 35,000 men. Now, at that time in history, that is not a big army. That tells you that they were young and they were strong and they took over the world. It represents agility and quickness. This is what the Grecian Empire, and this is how they ruled. Understand, if we're looking at the Bible, this, Daniel sees this in future. This is happening in intertestament time. So if you go to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and John the Baptist is like the first prophet in Matthew, this story that Daniel sees, this is where this take pla takes place, intertestament. The 400 years of silence where God was silent to his people. Not until John the Baptist came and proclaimed who was coming to be the savior of the world. So 300 B.C. is when the, 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 Greece, the Grecians ruled. This is where you find this story. This dream of Daniel, what he sees is happening in her testament. 
Okay, you got understand that? In the, in, the, in, the, in the phase of history, this is where we are at. Remember, Alexander the Great died at 33 years of age. He was young. He did not have children. So he gave his kingdom and divided it between four generals. Actually, the last words of Alexander the Great were divided among the great. So they divided his land among four kings. Last week, those four kings represented four heads. <laughs> Today, they represent four horns coming out of the goat's head. Now, I just wanted to stop here, just pause for a moment in our story. And I want to look at two thoughts, two, two truths this morning. When you see Daniel, and we can look back and see, he's seen something that he was 100 years removed from in the past. He, he did not see this. Many theologians, many scholars believe, and they don't believe God's word, they're liberal theologians, and they say that Daniel, he, 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 he witnessed this. He was part of this. He was just recounting history. It's impossible. When you do the math of how long Daniel lived, he was not living here when this happened. It's God's word. God's word is true. Prophecy that is fulfilled. We can bank on that, brothers and sisters. And, I, and I'm going to say it until I'm blue in the face, but as we come into a hostile culture in which we're living, we need to stand on this truth of God. These prophecies that are being fulfilled is just more proof that God's word is true. Oh, you're awake. Good. That is great. It's good to hear. Like the story this week of Oral Roberts University that made it into the Sweet 16. Now, I know the Lynches are getting flinches because ORU beat their team, Ohio State. Okay, and ORU was a bottom seat. Sorry, guys. I know we had to do a lot of counseling with you this week because Ohio State lost. But I don't know if you read in the USA Today, a columnist wanted ORU, and ORU is a Christian university now. They're charismatic in nature. We would agree to disagree in many of their theological viewpoints, but they took a stand. They have in their, in their documents, in their college, that with the dealing with the LGBTQ issue, and they're not permitted to be a college. They, they don't practice that lifestyle. Well, there's one columnist that wanted them to be disqualified from the Sweet 16 because of that. And ORU, the university, says this is what we believe, and we will continue to stand. See, it's, 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 it's situations like that that all of us here, at some point or another, may be faced with the stand on the truth of God's Word. Okay? And, it's, and the time is coming. And so understand, we can see what's why prophecy is being fulfilled. God's Word is true, and you can't go wrong resting in that fact. Amen, brothers and sisters? We can't go wrong in believing God's word. May we lose our job? May we lose our friends? Yeah, possibly so. But I want to hear the words when I get to heaven, those words from Jesus, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. I know you feel the same way. So not only we can stand on God's truth, that's the first truth we learn here just in this story. Secondly is this, going back to the Greeks. The Greeks, Greeks not only ruled militarily, they ruled culturally. Now just, just follow me. A minute here. Here, Alexander the Great took over the world. The Greeks. Was that a mistake? It was silent years of God to, 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 to his people. Was God still sovereign in charge? Yeah, just follow me with this for a moment. So the time that Jesus came to earth, what was the language? Kinoia, Koinonia Greek was the language that was spoken all over the world. You say, so what? One language, one communication, to communicate the truth of God's Son, Jesus, to come and take care of the sins of the world. And that gospel could be told throughout the world in one language that everyone understood. Is that a mistake? Is that a coincidence? You get you excited! excited! about God and His Word and His truth and what He is doing here. You know, it's a corny statement. I grew up hearing it, you know, history is His story, but it is true. God stands outside of time, and everything that He fixates and everything He works and everything that's happening is His story. From creation 
to eternity. He will receive glory because he has allowed things to happen. He has placed people where he wants, uh, wants them. And he's placed Alexander the Great in Inner Testament times to bring the Greek culture into the world for the purpose of his son, son Jesus coming and communicating the gospel to the world. That is amazing. We can rely on God's word and God's plan. Amen? Okay. Verses 9 through 14. The little horn. So again, you have these four horns. And out of one of those horns, the four generals, another little horn comes up. And you're like, why is Daniel dreaming about, like, this little horn is like, it's like he always, it's, that's his big thing in a dream. Well, let's see what that is. Verse 9. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, towards the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven and, the, and the, some of the host and some of the the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of the sanctuary was overthrown. This is referring to the, the temple of God here on earth, and we'll, 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 we'll follow up with that in a moment. Verse 12, and a host will be giving over to it together, and the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will, be thrown, and it will throw the truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking to another holy one, said to the one who spoke. Again, two angels having a conversation here. For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering? The offering that Israel used to give towards God in their temple. How long? The transgression that makes desolate and the giving over of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. How long will this desecration happen? And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to the rightful state. Who is this little horn? Hold on. You think before you speak. Who is the little horn? We have probably grew up thinking, this is the Antichrist. And it's not the Antichrist. What? Last week you talked about this little horn. It was the Antichrist. And now it's another little horn. I'm confused. Well, don't be confused. I'm going to go straight it out for you this morning. So last week, the little horn came out of which empire? The revised Roman Empire. He is the Antichrist. That was future. Remember Daniel seeing future? Well, today, this little horn is coming out of which empire? The Grecian Empire. The Grecian Empire. So now, what we're seeing this morning, chapter 8, is history for us. You say, well, are, are you, I, I don't understand what you're saying here. This already happened. This happened at the time of the Grecian Empire. This man rose, and we're going to tell you who this man is. Remember the four generals that were given the land? Their names are Seleucia, Ptolemy, Cassander, and Lymascus. You'll see the map there. You see Seleucia, that's our key player here. He was the, the most powerful general under uh, Alexander the Great's army. Eight kings after him, there was a guy that took throne by the name of Antioch the Fourth or as he called himself, Antioch Epiphany. Now, just by that name, you would kind of say what kind of guy he is. What's, Epi what's Epiphany mean? I am God. I am deity. I deserve to be worshipped. That's what he called himself. Can you imagine calling yourself God? I deserve to be worshipped. Well, the Jews had a nickname for him. His name was Antioch Epimanus, which means madman or animal. Now, just to put that in the back of your mind, fun fact for you that Antioch Epiphanes, according to verse 25 of chapter 8, did not die by human hand, meaning he was not killed in battle. You know how he died? He died of insanity. Interesting that the Jews gave him the name Madman, and he died of insanity. Now, that's just a fun fact for you this morning, okay? But verse 25 tells us he was not killed in battle. God took care of him at the right time. So what we have here in chapter 8 is this. This man, Antioch, is a precursor, a type of the Antichrist that will happen in Revelation. So, for instance, you go home, you turn on Netflix, and you, you, you put that cursor on the movie you want to watch. What's it do? It shows you a trailer. It gives you a description of what the movie's about. When we put our cursor on Daniel 8, it is a trailer of what's to come at the end times. 
That's the way we look at Daniel. Daniel, you put that cursor on, on, on chapter 8, and it shows us, okay, this guy, Antioch, was a bad dude, but guess what? This Antichrist, this is a, it's a precursor of what's going to come down, down the past, down to the future. Verse 11, some things that kind of correlate with the Antichrist. He exalted himself higher than God, verse 11. He disgraced worse. It says he threw truth to the ground. He disrespect, he dishonored God. Well, what will happen to the Antichrist in, the, in, in Revelation? He will do the exact same thing. I love that in the text it says he will prosper. Will the Antichrist prosper? Don't, don't you hate when bad people prosper? It drives you, up, it drives you mad. Like, why is that person getting you? Well, here's the prayer. God, please just, just bring your wrath upon them. Kill them. Burn them up. Smoke them, right? In our minds, we're like, we want them to be destroyed. Brothers and sisters, understand this. God's time will come. Wickedness will not prevail in the world. Verse 13, he desecrated the temple, and that's key. He desecrated the temple. The, the angels ask, how long will the temple be disgraced? Do you know that history tells us that the temple during this time of Antioch and Epiphanes was shut down because it was disgraced so bad? Can you imagine how bad a building has to be disgraced for you, so you can't worship it? Can you imagine, listen, we can't come to Faith Bible and, and worship this morning because it's just totally it's disgraced. Antioch and Epiphanes, he ruined the temple's worship. Now look at the verse 14, the question is asked, when will temple worship be reinstituted? 2,300 days. How do we know it's days? It says morning and evening. See, in the area of, of theology and, and study and doctrine and interpretation, when we see numbers in the Bible, we need to pay attention. Here at Faith Bible Church, we take the Word of God to be literal. Okay, there's, there's some uh, brothers, I have friends of mine that will take certain parts of the Bible allegorically or figuratively, meaning, well, that number doesn't really mean, yes, it does. Let me give you some examples. So when we go to Genesis chapter 1 and we see the word day, evening and morning are the first what? Day. The Hebrew word there is om. It's a 24-hour period. However, there's many people that fight the creation battle saying there's gaps between days, and we can agree to disagree. But when the Bible says that God created the evenings and the mornings, the first day, 24 hour, he spoke time into existence, it's literal. It's literal. Genesis chapter 6, when God told Noah to build the ark, he gave specific instructions. In fact, many of us have visited that replica out in Kentucky. Speaking of Kentucky, it's good to have Evan Towdy and his wife here this morning. Evan, say hi. Good. Evan's here. For those who don't know Evan, Evan grew up here in the church. So I, I don't know how I connected Kentucky with Evan, but I did. But it's good having you here, buddy. Good having you here. But that, that individual took the, the, the blueprints. And where did he find the blueprints? Oh. It was literal. Doesn't that arc? He, he followed the blueprints of, the, uh, of Scripture. 1 Kings chapter 7, Solomon followed the blueprints of what God wanted for his temple. It wasn't figurative. And the, argument, or the, uh, the arguments that we have in theological circles, particularly with prophecy, there's two particular numbers, the seven-year tribulation period and the thousand-year reign of Christ. People will argue that, well, that doesn't mean that we're not going to be reigning thousand years with Jesus. Let me, just, let me just tell you, yes, we are. It's literal. There will be a seven-year tribulation period here on the earth. There's nothing figurative, allegorical about it. It's literal. There's guys with more degrees than a thermometer would argue us, but I'm just like, this is what the Bible says. You can call me stupid. I believe it to be literal. And that's what it is. And we come to this, this particular number, 2300 is days. Again, it's during this, one, make sure we understand where this is at in history, intertestament time. Antioch and Epiphanes went into the temple, desecrated the temple in September of 170 B.C. He was upset that he lost a battle to Ptolemy in the south. He came through Jerusalem. He desecrated the temple. He killed Jews. And for six and a third years, that temple was desecrated. And guess how many days that is until it was restored? 2,300 days. Again, this is already passed, and we have it figured out. We didn't make this up. 
You see, individuals get in trouble when they interpret prophecy. Like our, our good friend, not good friend, William Miller, a 19th century preacher, who took this text, who took this number, and said, oh, those evenings and mornings, that's years, and, and this, is, this is when Jesus is going to come. Okay, for those that are visiting, for those that are watching us, and maybe you don't really read the Bible, you could read this text and say, that's not what it says. But many individuals like to take text out of context to fit their narrative of what they want. And so he said from 2,300 years from the time Antioch desecrated the temple is when Jesus is going to come. Well, that was the year 1844. Well, he and his followers sold all their houses, gave up, quit their jobs, gave up all their belongings, and they went to the mountains to live to wait for Jesus to come. Well, 1844 came. And 1844 went, and there was no Jesus. Church history calls this the great disappointment because these followers were disappointing. They were, they were disappointed at what did not happen. It's very, very easy to get distracted and follow different interpretations away from what Scripture intended it to be. In fact, there's two false religions Two false religions that came out of this great disappointment. Charles Russell of the Jehovah's Witness came out of that great disappointment. And Ellen White came out of that great disappointment, which started the Seventh-day Adventists. Two religions that even went even far left in theology. And look at all the followers they have. Life lesson for us is this. There's good intentioned people that try to articulate and interpret Scripture. We need to stay with what the text says. Historically, culturally, word meanings, grammar meanings. Make sure when you start hearing people talk about prophecy, and you're like, I don't, that does, check it. Double check. Ask your pastor. Ask your friend. Hey, I'm not, this Bible doesn't, that is good Bible study. Because that'll save us from getting in trouble like William Miller did. William Miller. So now on to our next portion of scripture. That was just extra for you this morning in the area of interpretation. Verses 15 through 27. Again, we've, we're going to uh, kind of just skim down through. This is Daniel again. See, it says there, I seen a vision. I sought to understand it. Again, he comes to this vision. He wants to understand what the angel just t- told him about the, the Greeks and, the, and this horn coming out, the other horn. So let's go down to verse 23 because we know that the, we read at the beginning of the service that the, what the ram meant, what the goat meant. Verse 23. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king, a bold-faced one, this is that little horn coming out of the Seleucid Empire, who understands riddles shall arise. This is Antioch and Epiphanes. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. He shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and people who are the saints. Okay, this is not talking about the tribulation. This is talking about the Jews that he killed. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many. He shall even rise up against the prince of princes, meaning he thought he was God. Sounds like someone else that we're going to come across in Revelation. He shall be broken, but, but, but not by human hands. And we already talked about how he actually died. So let's find out why Antioch and Epiphanes was such a bad dude. Well, he persecuted Jewish people. He killed over 100,000 Jews and put 50 more thousand in slavery. He made it illegal to follow the law of God. He plundered the temple. And here's how he plundered it. He came into the temple. He, uh, he, he, he erected Zeus, the god that he worshipped, the Grecian god. He sacrificed the pig on the altar, and he made the Jews eat the pig that were in the temple. If we understand Jewish theology, Jewish history, they would rather have died than do that. This is what Antioch and Epiphanes, this is the kind of guy he was. Actually, Matthew 24, we read, we read the, the account of Jesus talking, his, talking to his disciples. And he says, hey, listen, when you see the abomination of desolation as Daniel prophesied, what's he tell them to do? Run to the hills. See, in Jewish history, this was, this is remembered what Antioch Epiphanes did. And Jesus, hey, when you see it, it's going to happen again. When you see this, you run because bad things are going to happen. Now, when you come to the end of the chapter, you come to the end of the story, 
This is sad. It's like, man, who is this guy? This guy's killing Jews. Man, uh, you want some good news? Oh, only one person wants good news. Okay. All right. So we have to go out of, the, out of Scripture into history to find out how this plays out. Well, September of 170 B.C., Antioch and Epiphanes desecrated the temple. We explained what he did, the vile thing in which he did to the Jewish worship system. 2,300 days later came to December of 164 B.C. See how those numbers work out. A guy by the name of Judas Maccabees, a.k.a., his name is interpreted, the Hammer. That would be a cool name. Mark, can you imagine being introduced before a game? And now starting at center, 6'6", 250 pounds, Judas the Hammer, right? This is, this is the guy, man, having that nickname, but actually his name, his name was interpreted that, Maccabees. He and other godly Jewish people revolted against Antioch and Epiphany reclaimed the temple in December of 164, 2,300 days after the desecration of it. And it's very interesting. They went into the temple, were putting up the lanterns, the menorah, trying to get it cleaned up. They found a little vial of oil that would last one day of burning in the, in, in, in the, in the lanterns. One day, that was it. So they could make more. So they put them in the lanterns to get them burned, to get the rededicated start. They say, they claim this, this is God's temple again. It was very interesting. Those candles, those lanterns burnt for one day, three days, five days, eight days those candles burnt. They said this is a miracle from God. They had, in that time, they had plenty of time to get oil to replenish the lanterns, to continue the worship of God. They called it the Festival of Lights. John 10 talks of Jesus celebrating the Feast of Dedication, which is the Festival of Lights, remembering how God delivered them and, the, and God's faithfulness from a man by the name of Antioch and Epiphanes who desecrated the temple. And you want to hear something else that's very, very cool? December, what do the Jews celebrate? Hanukkah. You know what Hanukkah is? Hanukkah is the Feast of Dedication. It's the Festival of Light. So Hanukkah is just not another holiday. We have Christmas. Oh, the Jews have Hanukkah. They can open for No, it's more, it's deeper than just another holiday. They are remembering the day God delivered them from a madman who desecrated the temple. Isn't, isn't that, you know, the Jews have, we have the, the, the Jewish people have Passover, and Passover, again, is a holiday to remember God's deliverance from Egypt. So how about us? There are, there are times, there's a little bit of application here this morning as we close. We think of our salvation, all of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That was a day that God delivered us from the bondage of sin. We trusted him. We asked Christ into our life. And guess what? He lifted that burden of sin off of us and took it upon himself. If I was to ask any individual in here, do you remember the day you trusted Christ, your Savior? You're going to say, I, I remember. And some of us in here remember the life that we lived before Christ. And it's a day you say, man, God changed me. Or maybe it's a time in your life where you, you, have, you were in a dark place. And God used people, God used his word, God used the church to bring you back out of that. And that's a day you remember. You know what? I remember that day and what God did. And I remember those days. As we talk about in Joshua, God set up memorial stones. Are there memorial stones in your life of what, how God had protected you? He should remain faithful to you. Don't forget about those days. The Jews don't forget about the Festival of Lights. They remember God's provision and his faithfulness. So as we close this morning, Daniel chapter 8, look at verse 26 and 27. What was Daniel's response to all this? Verse 26, the vision of the evening and the morning has been told is true, but seal up the vision. I mean, hey, you just keep this to yourself, for it refers to many days from now. Now look, I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I arose, then I rose and went to the king's went on the king's business, but I was appalled, meaning astonished by the vision and didn't understand it. What, so what's, what, what affected Daniel? What, what happened to Daniel? He was sick, laid for days in this vision that he's seen. Let me ask you a question, because prophecy, a lot of times, I know when I studied prophecy, what application do we take with prophecy? We know it's coming, 
So how do we apply this to our lives in 21st century, waiting for Jesus to come? Let me ask you a question. How do you see your loved ones and your friends and family don't know Jesus? The prophecy should do a couple things in our lives. And I want to give you three takeaway truths this morning. First is this. God warns us of a last day ruler. See, we understand today Daniel 8 is a precursor of the Antichrist to come. We know he's coming. The last 2,000 years, we have been in the last days, right? Paul tells Timothy that. And we're waiting for, please, Jesus, come. Please, Jesus, come. We know that this Antichrist is coming. How are you living your life? How are you sharing with others? See, we know a last day ruler is coming. It should lead us to living our life with urgency. Our second truth this morning. Living our life with urgency. What's on your mind this morning? What's on your mind? Are you worried about your job, your family, your friends, your health, your wealth, your hobbies? We focus on these things, and they're not bad things. They're things that God has given us to enjoy and be part of. But are we living a life of urgency, understanding that Jesus could come, and we know what the future holds for people who don't know Jesus? Daniel was sick in what he's seen. I can't believe my people are, are going to go through this. This affected him physically. You ever think about your loved ones and your friends and the future that awaits them without Christ? The thought should change the very, the very way we deal with them in a sense of being urgent to share Jesus, to be influenced, to share Jesus with them. Because one day it's going to be too late. Our third truth as we close this morning is this. Number three, let your heart ache for this world. May your heart ache for this world. We should ask the question, am I ready? Am I ready to see Jesus? But this should get us thinking about tomorrow when you go to work and you rub shoulders with that, that co-worker, that neighbor. And what is their future hold? Christ. We know what it is. And it's not good. So why not live with urgency? Let your heart ache for the world. Pray for your neighbors. Whatever opportunity you have to share with them, do just that. In fact, we see here in the last verse in Daniel 8, verse 27, and then I arose and went about the king's business. He went about doing his job. Church, I want to close with Acts 1.8. But, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Brothers and sisters, this is our king's business for us. This is our king's business for us. Yes, tomorrow you're going to get up, go to work, you're going to do, go to school, young kids, and, and you're going to do your life. But as we're doing life, we can still be about the king's business and being our witnesses in Jerusalem, our local, Judea, outskirts, and the uttermost parts of the world. Prophecy should strive in our hearts, fuel us to understand that life is coming to an end of how we know it. And we want our brothers and sisters, we want our friends and family, we want our co-workers to be on the victor side. Amen? And so let's be faithful this week in being urgent when we... When we read prophecy, we get caught up in a lot of the details, and it's good to know as Christians, but the bottom line is, we'll be in heaven with Jesus, and our friends and family who don't know Christ will be here going through the type of Antioch Epiphanies through the Antichrist. And we don't want that. We don't want that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, help us, Father, to be faithful and just living the life you've given us, being an influence as we study Daniel 1 through 6 and the influence that you allowed him and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be, to be promoted in the Babylonian Empire, to be promoted in the Medo-Persian Empire for the purpose of being an influence. These kings trusted Daniel because of his testimony. Lord, allow us to go and be a light this week, to be a testimony for you. As head bowed and eyes are closed, just I want you to think about one individual this week that you can 
be urgent with. Someone you have a good relationship with, someone that trusts you, that you have a good influence, that you can share with them the good news of Jesus. Understanding the living that, that life of urgency, not knowing when Jesus is going to come. Who can you share your faith with this week? Not to be annoying, not to put the Bible in their face and say, you need to turn to Jesus. No, but someone that trusts you, someone that you can have a conversation with, someone that you know needs Jesus. Pray right now as you're sitting here and just say, Lord, give me an opportunity. Open a door this week. Open a door this week that will give me a chance to share this great gospel that will save them from hell. Father, give us a great rest of the day. We love you, and we thank you for this time we have to come together. In your precious name, amen. Let's all stand and we'll sing the chorus, Death Was Arrested. Oh, your grace, oh, me, watch Jesus.